Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back from the break. My name is Tisa Murdoch, and I'm the Director of Industry Solutions from VMware, and I have the privilege of introducing the next presenter. For those of you who are not familiar with VMware, we're a software technology company that specializes in virtualization solutions from the data center to the cloud to mobile devices. I found the, uh, the first two presentations fascinating from um, Terry Lundgren and from Margot, especially how retail is using technology to transform their business. And I think everybody in the room will agree that having access to consumer data and information just helps us make better business decisions. <clears throat> Our next presenter, Sarah Quinlan, is able to analyze billions of anonymous MasterCard transactions and then determine and predict spending and consumer buying habits. And from this data, she then provides her clients an actionable report and shows them how they can use this to help them improve their customer service, better, better meet their customer needs, and eventually increase their profits. Sarah and her team are able to do this for not only the retail industry, but also for banking, capital markets, and government agencies. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Sarah Quinlan, Senior Vice President and Head of Market Insights for MasterCard Advisors. So the key is never to trip going up the stairs, okay? Start with that. Hey, made it, good. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so very much for uh, having me out here. Thank you, Terry, I love this conference. Um, you know, I came out and uh, spent a day with the students uh, this year and it was a blast because it was really important to understand. So I'm a geek. Um, I went to University of Chicago. I have a double degree. I'm totally a geek. But I'm a geek with an attitude. And the attitude is how do we actually make money out of data, all right? We've been talking about big data, big data, big data. But what are we actually doing with it? Well, I have big data. So let me tell you a little bit my, about my data. First, I got to show you this. I have lawyers. They make me show you this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So. While you're looking at that, I'll tell you that we um, see 160 million transactions an hour at MasterCard. That's it. Um, and with that, I have um, a few data scientists, yes, 2,000 of them behind me. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is they then take the data and they bring it up to get this total retail spend, including cash and check. All right, so this is not MasterCard data you're going to be looking at right now. This is the entire retail economy. And so I think it's very important to understand that, by the way, it's like the formula of Coke. Only seven people know it at MasterCard. I know where their children live, so they cannot leave. And so the key thing here is to understand what to do with it. So I'm going to take you through first to understand the economy, and then you're going to understand why omnichannel will never be spoken out of your words a mouth again. You're going to talk about just reaching the consumer and giving them an experience. Okay, whoa, starts with gasoline. Hmm, why? Well, there's nothing more important in this country than the price of oil and the price of gasoline. I traded oil for 28 years as a hedge fund manager. I promise you, the greatest thing in the world is the price of oil is not going up anytime soon. And the good news to understand about that is there's such a glut of oil, it's literally sitting in ships all over the place, out in the, the Gulf of Mexico here, in the Gulf of Aden, everywhere. Um, I actually managed the wealth of a Saudi family. I sat on the oil for 10 years. So the key thing is to understand this price is coming down 33.5%. But the key thing to understand is that only consumption is what we want to look at. And consumption is actually down. So that means the average consumer in America will have $1,054 additional to spend this year. And guess what they're doing? Well, you know what the Americans do? When the tough goes shopping, they shop more, okay? So the key thing is we're seeing that money come into the market. So here's the US economy. This is how the government reports it. Just want to give you a little difference between the government and us, not to you know, throw a stone at them, but they only survey 50,000 50, retailers. I get everybody. There's no opt-out. So the smallest to the largest retailer are in my database. That is a key advantage, as you will see coming up here. But look at this. There's a couple things I want you to note here. So let's, you know, we did a little historical view with, with Terry before. We're going to talk a little history here. The most important month I want you to look at is that jump between September 2013 and October. Show of hands. Um, how many people think MasterCard's a payments company? 
right answer. We're a technology company, right? And so the key thing is understanding what was the thing that people spent on, right? Because that's where I can help give you an actual insight. So what was the number one spending category, I'm going to be listening here, um, of what we spent on in October 2013? Oh, dear, dear. You all have no flight of fantasy. All right, so let me be very clear. It is an absolute, in Sarah Quinlan's life, necessity. Of course, technically, it's discretionary and it was jewelry. All right, now think about this. Why are we spending on jewelry in October unless we're apologizing? Um, well, actually, we're spending on jewelry because it feels permanent to us. The change post the recession was that we realized we had permanent wealth loss. We lost homes, we lost jobs, we maybe lost both. We had to move. We changed and adjusted our lives everywhere. And thus, People want a feeling of experiences because those are permanent. You can't take my memories away from me. So we turned into an experiential economy, and jewelry actually fits that category. The necklace I'm wearing, the bracelet I'm wearing, I actually have bought in Rio. But in fact, it is a jeweler that is also on Fifth Avenue, but they do not sell this collection on Fifth Avenue. So I have a unique experience that I have, and my daughter is looking forward to having one day herself. Yes, we love millennial children. They're waiting for us to die. Okay, so, but the reality is that, but what's, what's so interesting about this, when you think about this, is it created an experience when I was down there in Rio, selecting it, working with the owner of the store, understanding it. And so it's the experience I'm remembering. Okay, so then you see, what does that tell me, though? What it tells me, though, is when we start spending discretionarily on jewelry, we feel confidence right? We're not just spending on what we have to spend anymore. So the good news was I knew we were off to the races. And you'll say, okay, January, February, March, we're down. That was that we were frozen. It is in fact, because if I looked around the rest of the country, we call it a smile. We see from California down to Texas, over to Florida, up to South Carolina, everyone was spending like mad in January through March 2014. It was only where we were frozen. So what does this mean? Online needs to be there. So one of the big in initiatives we're involved with is we made an announcement that we are going to get 500 million more people financially included in the world by 2020. We did this announcement with the UN this week. And that's the key thing. There are people in the United States who are unbanked and underbanked who don't have the ability to go online. So therefore, that's why prepaid cards are so critical. That's not gift cards, prepaid cards, where they have the ability to spend everywhere. And if you as a retailer issue a prepaid card, you know what they do away from you. How valuable is that information? Terry was telling you, he wants to know what they do. That's the key thing, is there's other ways to figure it out. Okay, then you see, obviously we're off to the races once the weather got good. And then Christmas was actually very good, so respectfully to our friends at the NRF, I disagree. Actually, um, Black Friday was up 0.9% year on year, okay? It was not down 11. Um, what was the difference? We shopped small. We shopped small, and that was where the numbers came in. All right, so then you see, all right, January, February, March looked really bad. Okay, no, they weren't. Here you go. Now look at this chart. This is if I take out gasoline, which is 12% of total retail spending. See the geek in me? So understanding the value of realizing, okay, that, that part is the gift. And you can see the consumer is spending like mad. 4.9% in January, 4.7% in February, 4.8% in March, year on year growth. That's solid. That is not a recession. That is not a problem. That consumer is spending. Are you capturing your share? That is the key thing you need to understand and think about. And that's really understanding the value of the data. This allows you to compare yourself against others and understand what's actually happening. OK, here's what's kicking butt. These are retailers with 50 million of sales or less. The numbers are between 3 and 6% a month better. Look at that in March. I just said 4.8 for total retail sales. It's 7.5% of these smaller retailers. So the key thing to understand is how do you, if you're a larger retailer, make your store feel personal, feel unique, create that experience for the consumer because they're telling you with their hard-earned dollars that they want to spend that way and they don't want to spend another way. And that is the key thing to understanding this. All right, so what's next? Well, let's look at it regionally, all right? So the key thing to understand here, the strongest area in the country month after month after month is the southeast. And you'll say, why? Well, who lives there? The baby boomers. 
and they are the richest people in this country. And they are spending. And then who else has moved down there? All the young people to support the baby boomers who are retired. So this is the key thing to understand. You have to think about the patterns of spending. I am most concerned, and I have to really say, I'm usually, um, my nickname on Wall Street is Duchess of Doom, so here's my doom part of life. Um, I'm very concerned about the Northeast. This is the sixth consecutive month in a row where the Northeast is negative year over year. So, uh, so let's go into a few of the reasons why. Well, first and foremost, um, what, it, what dominates hiring in the Northeast? It's the financial sector. And here's where technology is a negative, right? Because 250,000 jobs have permanently been lost in the financial sector, and they're not coming back because of efficiency. Um, as a hedge fund manager, I used to have a, a team of 53. I don't need 53 people anymore if I was running my hedge fund now, because it's much more efficient to trade. Information can be aggregated much more easily. So the key thing is it's not going to employ as many people. Now, the great news is because New York is becoming, you know, and always has been the advertising hub, we're seeing Google, you know, implying employing 5,000 people there. My daughter has worked for Twitter. They've got 1,000 people there. So you're seeing a technology hub opening up, for example, there, but it's not replacing all these jobs. And then the final thing was, Wall Street had a horrible fourth quarter, and, when they do, and they didn't bonus. They announced. A number of the big banks announced they weren't bonusing. And the difference post the recession is if we don't have money, we don't spend. You might go to our website. We just did our annual survey of credit versus debit spending. And what's very interesting is uh, before the recession, get this, the average consumer had eight credit cards in their wallet. It's unbelievable, right? They've got about four now. But what's interesting is they've become transactors. Transactors in our lingo are people that pay off every month. So the key thing is we want them to actually hold a balance. So only finally in 2014 did we see people start to carry a very small balance. So it's a very different way that the consumer spends. They only spend when they have money. And so it's a, a, you've got to figure out how to capture that spending you know, when it happens. And that's the most important thing to realize. This consumer is evolving and changing. But do, make no mind about it. This consumer is 100% in charge. And she, and I said she because 75% of transactions are still done by women, um, she is clearly very determined on what she wants to buy, how she wants to spend it, who she wants to spend it with, and where she's going to spend it. OK, so who, what is she doing? Well, a couple things she's doing. This is automotive repairs and tires. If that's negative, what are we doing? We're buying cars. So I want you to note this is not typically part of retail statistics, but this is a competitor to you. We are replacing cars. The average age of the car in the United States is 10.4 years. So what's happened, the average car being purchased is $34,000. That's not a small amount of money. So the consumer has money again. So, all right, here, listen to me. Here's your next insight. Stop discounting. She has money. It's the value that you're bringing in the merchandise. Stop going to the lowest denominator. You're delaying her spending. She's got money out there. She's spending it. If she's buying a $34,000 car, she has no problem coming in and buying a $200 sweater. All right? So let's think about it from this perspective. All right. The other thing I want to note is we are living in smaller spaces. So I actually made a call last August, you know, a year ago, August, in August 13, that the housing recovery was over. Now, we had a good housing number yesterday, but make no mind about it. The reality is, is most people, they, you know, they've talked a lot about urbanization. That's not exactly what I see in the data. What I see is people are moving closer to where they live. So I'm a perfect example. I grew up in downtown Boston. I'm about as city girl as you can get. I didn't actually get a driver's license until I was 26 because I moved to California and I had to. All right, so the reality is, is that um, I choose to live in cities, but I now live in Greenwich, Connecticut. Now, I actually do need a passport to live there, I'm convinced, because it's very foreign for me. But the reality is it's seven minutes from my work and purchase. And that was the value for me. I wanted to be close to where I worked and lived because it's not valuable for me to lose an hour and a half each way. I would rather be at the gym. I would rather be doing other things. And that's what people value. People have no time. Two people in a family are working now. You must remember that. I see that in their spend. How do I know that? They both buy lunch in different places every single day. They're picking up the kids at a different time. All right, so we can actually see, because one of the things that people see in, is that we see that um, any food that's bought, any um, gasoline that's bought within uh, 3 to 5 p.m., food's bought within two hours. And that's exactly the difference of, of how we understand the patterns that come out of the data, which is so critical. So one of the things that I keep telling everybody, the other, how did everyone I, I make the call on housing? 
Look at the appliance numbers. They're awful. You only buy an appliance when you're, you own a house, not when you're renting. So the key things is this was the indicator to understand. You know, so, but we are buying furniture. Again, a confidence indicator because we're replacing as renters and that's the difference to understand. But we will have smaller spaces, which means we can't buy as much stuff. All right. Now, when I lived in New York City, um, I love to cook. I'm Italian, Irish. It's, it's just a bad curse. But the reality is, is that I love to cook. But I needed space, so my oven was reserved for my boots. Okay. So the reality is, is this is one of the issues to understand that, that, that we have smaller space. So what does it mean for you as retailers? The insight is to think about, you need to have merchandise that I need or that I want to replace. Because I'm replacing that winter coat. I'm not necessarily adding a new winter coat. So that's the thing to think about. What is going to make me do that replacement spending? All right, here's how we spent in March. Ignore hardware. That's just a rough winter, and we're repairing it. Ignore grocery. We hate to buy groceries. We actually don't cook anymore anywhere in the country. This is one of the issues that a lot of people have talked about why certain retailers are having challenging times. I would tell you they're leading with grocery. And the reality is, is because we have no time, people pick the kids up from soccer practice and they go out to dinner because they want the experience with their family of being with them as opposed to actually taking time to cook. It's probably not the healthiest. But that's why I would suggest if I was in the grocery business, I would be putting ready to, to cook meals up front that were healthy, that were what people wanted, as opposed to packaged goods and the other like. It's a real secular change. It's not going to happen just to, uh, uh, you know, this is not just an income thing. I want to be very clear about this. This is a change in behavior. So look at that restaurant spend. Fourth consecutive month of spend of growth over 7%. That includes December. We didn't go to grandmother's house and cook. All right, we went out for Christmas. And that's a big difference to understand. We want this experience. You can't get a reservation anywhere in this country right now. And by the way, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Why? We like our families and friends again. Before, before 2008, we didn't know them anymore. We just were buying stuff, all right? We just went shopping, 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 all right? Now we're like, no, 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 that didn't get me anywhere. So this is the big thing. Um, department stores, respectfully, Terry, um, with the exception of Macy's, <laughs> um, are not doing well, all right? And, and let's be perfectly honest, this is the first positive growth we've seen in department stores in a long period of time, and a lot of this was the Easter shift of a 15-day movement earlier of Easter so this is all the department stores in the entire country. So do remember, this is not a chain there. I want to also call out luxury, all right? It is no longer chic to be chic. Understand what I mean by this. I worked for a Saudi family, all right, for 10 years, all right? Understand that that family's been told not to go to London and buy because they don't want an Arab Spring in Saudi Arabia. All right, if you think about things like that, there is, you know, there's a crackdown on corruption in China. Brazil has a huge corruption scandal going with Petrobras right now. And then in the United States, you know that there's an issue with the 1%, and we talk about it, right? So as it's actually 0.1% of Americans made 12% of the income in the United States last year. 0.1. So the key thing is luxury is really hurting and has actually not been doing very well. So the key thing is you're a retailer, you want to be going after the aspiring affluent because they're spending all the time. And that is your customer. This is, goes exactly back to what Margaret was talking about in the know your customer. You absolutely have to understand who is actually spending. Not just I want them because they're going to spend $5,000 on a dress. That's not the person who's actually spending. All right. This is what we are doing. There are no children in school in America anymore. All right. We are flying every single month. This is the consumer. This is not business. If I actually look at business travel, it's actually not keeping pace with this because companies are not really doing as much investing in that as we are as consumers. This is interesting because if you think about it, up until the last few months, we, we didn't, the black line, which is the discounting, they, they, look at, they barely had to discount this past month at all to get us to buy. If you think they're ever going to roll back that fuel surcharge, you are absolutely insane. All right? Um, do realize it's the only industry in the history of America that has not made money, and it's only Warren Buffett's major mistake, as he made, and he'll say himself. All right? So the key thing to understand is we buy this ticket two months ahead of time before. Again, it's consumer confidence being shown here because it's saying in two months I have the confidence to actually pay for the vacation. And one, you know what happens when we take a flying vacation? We spend double what we spend on a driving vacation. And by the way, best fact yet for all those of you here in America, only 27% of Americans have a passport. They're not leaving the island. So you actually can find 
swimming, um, you know, you can find and them as customers and make its destination resorts. So they're going to be going to Miami. They're going to, you know, coming to New York this summer. They're going to come to Chicago. They're going to go to San Francisco, to LA. We see this and we build propensity models. This is how you use data. So we can actually target these people with digital audiences and reach them via Facebook, via direct email, you know, via TV, knowing where they're going. And that's the value, and that's understanding what it means to really know your customer and understand. And by the way, we've done a study called The Five Personas. It's on our website. And it shows that people don't mind sharing this information. Only 20% of people would prefer to never have anything. But since they answered the survey, they shared information. So it's not really logical, right? But that being said, and by the way, there is not an age demographic to that in our study. And this is the interesting thing. So my mother at 86 will share even more information than I will. So that's the most interesting thing. Um, so um, the interesting thing to note is the key thing that's even more important is what are we all doing? We're staying in a hotel right now that's full. Look at how much stronger the lodging is. So it's even more amazing when you look at this because you can actually see their price index. If you thought you paid more to come in here, you did. Okay, so the reality is, is that people are again saying, I'm going to spend this. So look, at, now they're all going out to dinner because they're flying on the vacation. They're out here and they're spending. And then what do they do? Remember, we have no time. All right. When do you think I do a lot of my shopping? I literally fly 95% of my time. So the key thing is I landed in London on, on Sunday. I had two hours before I had to, you know, have a meeting. I ran, not walked, ran to go shopping and get it in, all right? So, you know, the queen thanks me. Um, so the key thing is to understand is that's where you can, as a retailer, really think about. I just spoke at a conference on destination retail, all right? And that is what people are trying to understand. And how do I pull people in? Why? Because you can't necessarily think about it. If you're in other economies, our economies are the strongest in the world. It is powering forward, OK? But if you're in other economies right now, which many of the global retailers in this room are, You've got challenges, so you better be bringing people in if you're in Paris, because your economy's not doing good. You better pray you're bringing in all the Americans with their strong dollar over the summer to, to bring up your results. And that's how you think about this differently. All right, look at this. Do I need to say more? Right? But think about this. What's the challenge here? All right, well, I want you to know something that we, it doesn't matter what your income level is, we want this the way we want it. This is how I knew the economy was also back. We know we call it quick serve restaurants, that's fast food. That's doing horrible across the country, up 1%, and that's basically food prices being shared, all right? The next category up, which is fast casual, you know it's that uh, 1500 calorie burrito you think is healthy? Um, so, um, so, that category is growing 22.4% year on year, guys. All right? Because why? Because I can have it the way I want it. Put on extra guac. Go for it. You know, I mean, that's the whole point, is you can actually have it. So the consumer is in control. They want to take control of that experience. And casual dining is going 10.4%. And think about this. This is where the data is so valuable. Your favorite restaurant's a one-off. It's not necessarily a chain. So that's the key thing to appreciating what's going on here. All right, but what, it, so I, I'm not talking online. Well, I'll get there. But because I want you to realize we really don't cook. This is not a joke. So this doesn't create an experience for us. So I want you to think about if I was sitting in a store, what would I be doing? I would be bringing in chefs to teach me how to cook on that one day I might cook, right? I would be actually creating an experience. I would be, you know, bringing in, you know, sommeliers to teach me, you know, about wines, things like that. Create that experience in the store. I actually told a hardware store to bring in jewelry the other day. Look, you know, it's create the experience. All right, here's clothing. The reason this is important to realize, I'm very excited. We finally are buying clothes again. It's not that we've been running around naked, um, but the reality is we've been buying clothes twice a year. We've been buying it in October for the winter. We've been buying it in April for the summer and throwing a sweater on in between. All right? And it's not because we don't like clothes anymore, but it's because we didn't value it. You know, the question about value, it is so critical. We see this, this value for money economy that we are in is absolutely, doesn't matter your demographic, it doesn't matter what your income, that's what everybody's buying. Do I get some value out of this? Does this feel good? So that's why the teen apparel retailers are doing awful. They're discounting over 26% on average now. Right? But still, I'm not going to buy a $300 pair of jeans 
for my teenager who outgrows them in two months. That's so 2007. So the reality is, is you just don't see that behavior anymore. So you have to appreciate where the consumer finds value, and that's what you actually see. So apparel is doing significantly better. We like to see the fact we've got five months in a row positive and not the volatility we've had. Men, though, you still don't really buy, okay? It's just not happening. You buy really once a year when we see it. Um, and, and so, uh, but, you know, honestly, uh, if I was a department store, I would think about whether I move that up from the first floor, that prime retailer, because I'm telling you, you have no time. I might move that up to another floor because I know that the woman, like me, has no time, wants to come in and buy and then leave on my lunch break. But we do buy shoes, okay? And I am a testament to this um, and believe very strongly in this trend next to my jewelry trend. So the key thing to understand why, because they're very unique. I can actually wear one pair during the day, switch to go out in the evening, wear the same dress, change the look, change it. So we are in an accessorizing world. We find a lot of value in that. So this is something where you continue to see this value of, in footwear. So that's positive, and we've seen the prices go up there as well. They have not had to discount. Look at that trend, isn't that pretty? Um, so I just want you to know, this is 25 months in a row now of jewelry growth, 25 months in a row, not a negative month, not one. And what do you think the average price is that people, of jewelry people are buying? $2,400. Gentlemen, did you do that on Valentine's Day for your wife? Mm. So I wanna be really clear, this is not saying there is a recession. This is something people say, why? Jewelry is permanent. It is valuable. You can turn it over to someone, give it to them. It's an experience. It's very, very, very key. I tell that to my boyfriend all the time. But I told you, luxury's not doing so hot. So understanding this, so what is, so let me just stop here for a second before I go to online. What is this really telling us? It's telling you that the key thing you need to understand first and foremost, is your sector even something people want? I really want people to think about, people always go to the micro with the data and sitting there and wanting to know, you know, down to the CRM and everything. I'm not saying that's not important, but if you don't understand the macro trends and understand, for example, in the Northeast, that dollar is only going to get stronger, all right? Why do you think the Fed's not raising rates? Because they don't want that dollar to get even stronger. Because the fact is, not because it's going to hurt exports, that's only 15% of GDP. It's because it is going to hurt the tourists coming in. And it will hurt our domestic retailers because people won't be shopping here. And that is a critical thing. And we already see that in Miami. We see that in New York. We see that in San Francisco from China. So these are the key things to appreciate. It's a balance, and it's an international economy we live in. So understanding these things. So I want you to never lose sight of the macro being so critical for what we do. The department store is a little challenged. Now, this is all the department stores in the country, all right? And understand that this is a sector that clearly has, there are clear winners, and there's not clear, clear those of them that are not winning, all right? And the key thing is, is understanding, are they creating that experience? Because everything I've told you up to now, they sell. So the key thing is, are they able to get people and have that relationship with the customer to bring them in? Well, here's the interesting thing. They haven't been able to get them in the stores. Now remember, I'm not talking to individual retail here. This is all the department stores in the country. But understand, when you see that yellow line negative, that means bricks and mortar traffic is not working. But look at the online sales has actually been dropping until the last month, which is actually more of a, a mathematical effect due to an early Easter. So there's some real challenges in this sector. Now if I break out the moderate, it's even more difficult, right? So they clearly, it, and remember what I told you about the aspiring affluent. They're going up a level. And that's the key to appreciate. E-commerce, not too much different in the moderate. All right, again, mirroring it. But high-end, doing a little bit better. They've been able to reach out and get their consumer and get them to understand the value proposition, and they're knowing their clients more. The month-to-date, guys, why it's negative? It's clearly negative due to the early Easter shift, right? Very much so. But look at the e-commerce in, uh, in the high end. They have understood how to reach the consumer. But remember, it's not because the consumer um, doesn't have a mobile phone. They do, but not everybody has spent the money to actually re reach people. You know, we have an app called Quicker. Um, and Quicker allows people to be able to order, designate the time, already pay. So they walk in the store, they don't even have to pay. This app is just taking off. 
By the way, the best part about the app is we're putting it in all the sports stadiums in the country so you never miss a home run again. All right? But key thing to understand is the, why is the consumer loves it because that was something that was only re reserved for the rich seats at a stadium before, for example, or for people who are affluent. We're making this and democratizing this. That is what Omnichannel does. That's what the technology does. It allows a consumer, no matter what your wealth, to have that ability to be able to reach their, their um, consumer and be able to express themselves the way they choose to. All right, let's talk e-commerce. The exact number for everyone to know, this is the fact. 6.7% of sales are done online. That's it, okay? Last month it was 6.9. This is very worrisome if you spent all your life trying to figure this out, right? The important thing to recognize here is, more importantly, okay, is this next chart. To understand that growth rates have dropped into the single digits already and it was winter. That does not make logical sense, right? If it's winter, people should be buying more online, right? Because we were frozen. I am from Boston. Are you kidding me? Right? So, I mean, we couldn't get out of the house if we tried. So the, the point to understand here is there is still a misconnection with the consumer in terms of execution online. I cannot emphasize more strongly what both Margot and Terry said. It is not execution. Who cares? Are they your customer? Now, I happen to have a millennial child. She's turning 24 on Saturday. Um, and she calls me up and she'll say, Mom, let's have lunch. This is called OPM, other people's money. OK, so um, what this means is that she's calling up to say, A, will you pay for lunch? And usually she brings two friends with her, OK? And they drink now, so it's more expensive. Um, and, and, then, um, and then she says, oh, Mom, and she'll send me in advance the link of where we're going shopping, okay? Now, I go out with her to the stores because I'm obviously weak. Now, you know what's really interesting? My mother, when she kicked me out of the house after college, like, I never got this love, right? You know, where she's taking me shopping. But we feel sorry for these millennial kids for some reason. I have no idea. But don't worry. Retailers take advantage of it. But, but the key thing that's most interesting We'll go into a store that I would never, frankly, shop in for me, all right? And do you realize I have never had one single retailer, despite the fact my MasterCard goes flying across into that point-of-sale terminal, ever ask me for my email address or my business card? As Julia Roberts said in Pretty Woman, we all remember, <laughs> big mistake, okay? So the point that I want you to remember here is I'm the, she's your consumer, yeah, but she has no money, right? So find me, I do, all right? And I'm weak enough to buy for her, okay? And not just on her birthday. So the key thing is, again, broaden your horizons and use this email to check in. By the way, I have the whole list for, for her birthday this Saturday, right? So, I mean, and, she, and it gets more expensive as they get older. You know, I thought once I got her out the door, I got a bonus. It's not working, all right? So that's the key thing. So where do we spend online? So this is where we actually do 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 transactions. So if you're thinking about your store and how you reach out, what I'm telling you here is we do commodity stuff online. That's the key thing. So children's clothes, respectfully to all those who you design them, are a commodity. We know their size. If they're 6X, they're 6X, right? We know their shoes. If they're a 9, they're a 9, right? So the key thing is, parents, I told you, two people are working, and they have no time. So they've taken them out to dinner, they've come home, attempted to try to get them to do the homework, put them to bed, watched a little TV, probably streamed it, they've cut the cord anyway, right? And, and then, what do they do? Well, the mom goes online. By the way, did you send her an email? Um, they've told me five minutes, I'm going to be quick. Um, did, they, did you send her an email at 9.30? Because the first thing she does is she looks at her email, and then she shops. 10 o'clock is the number one time for shopping online. Does this make logical sense? Usually the women in the room not at this point. And that's the key thing to understanding. So the second thing she does buy for herself. So one of the things I would also tell you is stop changing the sizes. If I bought a six from you last time, I want the six to be the same six. So tell your designers to get themselves in order here. All right, because I don't care if the shipping's free or the return's free, I have no time. All right, so the idea that I've either got to drive to drop it off or do something else, that's insane. All right, it's not going to happen. Um, and by the way, one of the things that you're, you're all forgetting here, a lot of people get them delivered to the office. I have run into seven major companies in this country that have banned their employees from receiving boxes anymore. 
they say our mailroom is not for your personal use. This is going to become a trend, guys. So we need to think about not just click and collect, which I think is hugely important, but also are there other places we can use where I can pick them up? Because I might not be able still to get to that store. All right, in the hours. I might want to collect, pick it up. When I came in, you know, the other night I came in from London, it was one in the morning. I wouldn't have minded picking something up and getting it done. I'm, I'm awake anyway. All right, so think about it from that perspective. So again, give the consumer freedom. Um, the final thing I want to mention here is this is, gives you the share. All right, so one of the things that's also a bit concerning, this share hasn't changed in months. So apparel stock, now that is specialty apparel. That's not apparel sold in the department stores. I segregate just the department stores separately here. So they're at 25.6. These numbers have stagnated. So I want to be clear, I don't expect them, frankly, if I'm trending out and looking forward, for them to trend significantly forward from, from this. Again, this is saying where things stand and what they're doing. So what do you need to do? There's a couple things. Um, I don't know that many people know, but MasterCard was actually the technology behind Apple Pay. So we invented tokenization, which allows that security of that anonymous 16-digit number going up into the cloud every single time. That will be coming to other forms as well. So, you know, there are Android phones, so we will have that out there. That is a key thing, again, giving people this flexibility. Why? Do not kid yourself. The breaches were very jarring to people, all right? They, they don't mind sharing their information, but they want the security. They want that investment in that space. So giving them a digital wallet, like our MasterPass, or another digital wallet, is the most critical thing you can do because they want to be in control of payment. They're happy to share what they want to buy with you, what they're aspiring to buy, what they're thinking about, which is really what you need to know. You don't necessarily need their credit card. You need to know what they want to do. That's the key thing. So really separate these things out because that's the most critical thing. And, you know, we think, of course, there's only one word for that, of course. That's priceless. <laughs> so with that, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. I'll just keep talking, you know. As they age and mature, will you, do you expect that number of e-commerce sales as a percent to grow up significantly <laughs> as they gain more value uh, in the marketplace and their incomes increase? No. Really simple answer, no. Shopping is social. Think back to the horse and buggy stage when we all met at the general store in town. It's the same experience. My daughter and her friends, they go online together. It's, you know, they all text each other in the same room and this and that you know, at her apartment and such. But they still go out and meet together to go to the stores together. They want to touch. They want to feel. And so I don't expect this. What will happen that will go a bit more online is, is the key things of, I don't want to ever carry liquids again in my life. They're heavy, right? So the things of your white goods, those types of things, that will continue to trend upwards. I think we will take the, the, the sort of commodity things that are interesting. That's why 50% of electronics are done online. You know, you know, an iPad is an iPad is an iPad, so you're just you know, buying it and it gets shipped to you, right? But the key thing to understand is I cannot underestimate the, how experiential our spending is. We are all about the experience. That's why I didn't put up theaters up here. I didn't put up movies. I didn't put up all that stuff is just trending higher. It's all about the experience. And that, you know, if you think about it, where millennials are actually spending their money right now is the exact same way we are spending their money. You know, they're going on trips. They're doing those types of things. You know, my daughter was proud to tell me she saved enough money to, you know, go out to Fire Island with her friends this summer. That terrifies me. Um, but, you know, the, the point is, is that you understand that this is what they're doing. And, and, and so it's no different than us. The only thing that will be very different is they will continue to live closer to their workplaces. So again, this will mean different clusters. So I am concerned about the wayward sort of suburban malls in the sense that they will not be living in the McMansions in the suburbs way out there. That will not be the next trend. They will not want to maintain that because, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story. My um, daughter's company was actually bought by Twitter. Um, a two-year-old startup, $100 million, ridiculous. Um, but anyway, what happened was, all of a sudden, you know, six of the engineers were told, boom, leave New York, get on a plane to San Francisco, and by the way, you know, let me be clear, relocation benefits are not what they were pre the recession. 
So it's that or you, you don't have a job. So you sit there and realize, why do you want to have all these big investments in, in housing? So there's a different way that we're going to be looking at this. It's still something we're going to love our homes, but they're going to be different. Next question. One more question. Over this way. Mike over here. Good. Um, and uh, perhaps, um, perhaps uh, 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 Margot's suggestion that we start to call it all line is a good idea. So, so, so with that in mind, I'm thinking about the, it was one or two charts back where you showed the um, sort of stable proportion of online versus offline sales. And I wonder, should, should the conversation start to shift uh, for better precision about where the transaction takes place versus where the selling takes place? And can there be changes behind those numbers that we're not detecting when we look at them? Uh, I, no, I do see everything. So that is, that, that's not true. <laughs> I do see everything. Um, we actually own the data. So um, um, we do see that. But that being said, I think it, your point is absolutely valid, valid. The key thing to understand is, look, it is a shopping experience from the start of when they become aware of your brand to the next part of where they're thinking about your brand, to how they're curating, to how they're actually putting it together, how they're fitting it into the lives and their experiences that they're doing. The transaction, you know, Ajay, um, our, our CEO, says, you know, you don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna make a transaction today. You know, you wake up in the morning and you say, I'm gonna go, you know, to Tucson. I'm gonna, you know, go out to dinner with friends tonight. I'm gonna buy this, you know, I need to replace some boots. That's what you do. So the transaction should be absolutely seamless, all right? And where we do it doesn't really matter. The key thing, which is challenging for you, is to understand where the inventory should be. But I want to also take one last second before I'm kicked off the stage to tell you, I think the myth that I need it in two hours is a myth, OK? We don't see that in the spending behavior. People are more than willing to wait a short period of time. It's very rare that they need to do something and need something. It's only when um, my favorite airlines, God love them, loses my luggage, all right? I have to do something within two hours, right? But other than that, to be perfectly honest, most people are willing to take a day or, or a couple days to get whatever merchandise they're getting, all right? And that, unless they're physically in the store and they're wanting that experience right then. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference.